thinking about this message, I was reminded that sometimes when we talk about things like this, they can feel like a checklist of things to do. And I don't want you to leave today's message feeling like Pastor Jay just gave me one more thing to do. My plate's already full. I can't have another thing. As a matter of fact, last week we talked about living an unhurried life and how so many of us are busy and hurried and the thought of doing one more thing just seems untenable to us. Our marks of disciple are not a list of things to do. They are a picture of a person you and I are becoming. We're becoming more like Jesus. And so these marks of a disciple are intended to make you and me look more like him. Anybody in here like puzzles? I like puzzles. I like puzzles a lot. Anybody else like puzzles? Or am I the only nerd in here? All right, a few more nerds. Amen, nerds. We're good to go. But as you can see, I like small puzzles. This one's only 48 pieces. I have a thousand piece puzzle at my house that's been sitting in the closet for two years because I don't want to tackle it. But, you know, when we come to Jesus, we come to him a lot like a puzzle. You know, we have this picture on the outside of this, this thing that we look like, this thing that we think we want to become, but we come to him full of all these pieces. And today we're going to be talking about the mark of a disciple living a surrendered life. And what I want you to understand from the very start is that living a surrendered life means that we're giving Jesus all of us, not just a few pieces. Because this is how many of us come to Jesus. We're like, hey, Jesus, <laughs> I'm so thankful that you saved me because I didn't want to go to that place called hell. So you know what? Here's a couple of pieces of me that you can have to work with. And we wonder why we go through life not really feeling whole, not really feeling complete, not really feeling like we have purpose. And it's really because what we've done is we haven't put all of ourselves in the hands of the one who can put this picture together. We have not given all of ourselves to the one who knows what we're supposed to look like, who has the end in mind. We haven't given all of ourselves to him. And so we have a few pieces in his hands, and we got a few pieces in our hands, and we're wondering why this thing called life just won't come together for us. So we're going to talk today about living a surrendered life and really answer the question, what does it mean to live a surrendered life? Well, for me, I like definitions. So the first thing I want to do for you is define this word surrender. Surrender equals, it just means to cease resistance to an enemy or an opponent and submit to their authority. Now, when you hear that word surrender, what's the first picture that pops in your mind? For me, I think about a battle, right? And I think about this battle where, you know, the soldiers, they realize they're overwhelmed. And so they come out and they're waving the white flag and they're like, we're surrender. You know, don't shoot. Don't take us out. We surrender. They are giving in to their opponent. They are ceasing resisting. The question for you and for me and this idea of living a surrendered life is, who's our opponent? Who's this opponent that we are no longer going to resist? James chapter 4, verse 4 says, you adulterous people. I love the way James starts this. You adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. An enemy of God. Have you ever thought about the fact that at some point in your life, you were an enemy of God? Have you ever considered that? That at one time in my life, I was on the opposite end of the battlefield from God Almighty. At one time in my life, I was an opponent of his. So when we ask that question, who's the opponent? That opponent is God. That word enmity in there, you may not know what it means. It's kind of an older English word. It just means this. It's the state or a feeling of being actively opposed or hostile to someone or something. So you are actively opposed, actively hostile towards someone or something. We don't like to think of ourselves in those terms. And I know I'm just diving right in today, but, but we don't like to think of ourselves in those terms that at one point in my life, I was actively hostile towards God. And I was destined for his wrath, which means that he was actively hostile towards me in that moment. We don't like to think about that, that we were an enemy of God. And if we truly believe that God is sovereign, if we truly believe that he's God Almighty, I don't want to be found, excuse me, I don't want to be found fighting against him. 
You know, last week we talked about Psalm 4610 and this idea of living an unhurried life. We read this verse that said, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The NASB translation told us to cease striving, to stop fighting, that you and I, we can just take a step back and we can be still and we can know that he's God. But notice what he says here. He says, I will be exalted in the earth. God will be exalted in your life. Scripture tells us that a day will come where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. That means that whether you choose to surrender to God or not, that a day will come where he will be exalted in your life. You and I have the opportunity to surrender to him before we're forced to surrender to him. So the question, how do we live a surrendered life. Here's the answer. Here's the the crux of today's message. You and I live a surrendered life when we stop resisting God and we submit to his authority. How do you live a surrendered life? You stop resisting God and you submit to his authority. And that's the end of today's message. That's it. Yeah, come on. Let's go to IHOP, somebody. No, I'm just playing. That's not the end of today's message. Womp, womp. (laughs) I'm mad that y'all clapped, though. That's disrespectful. (laughs) We stop resisting God. We submit to his authority. Let me ask you a question up front. Do you believe that God is God? And if you believe that God is God, why do you resist him? Why do you not submit to his authority? If he truly is God Almighty, if he's the one who formed you in your mother's womb, if he's the one who breathed life into you and has the power to take it away, why do you resist him? Why do you not submit to his authority? And so our big question today is this, what does it look like to live a surrendered life? I think we all know, if you've been around church for any period of time, if you've ever read any part of the Bible, I think we have an idea that we are supposed to live surrendered to him. But I don't think we always know what that looks like. And so what I want to do for you today is I want to look at three different people in Scripture. It's actually five people, but two of them are in groups. But I want to look at three different sets of people in Scripture that I believe give us aspects of what it looks like for you and me to live a surrendered life. And we're going to learn a lesson from each one of them that we can apply to our lives. And then we're going to talk about what it looks like in our context. Because these biblical characters, they lived, they were real people who lived at a real time, but their context was different. They lived in a real time that was 2,000 plus years ago. So life was a little different for them. And so we're going to talk about what this looks like in our context. So what does it look like for you and me to live a surrendered life? The first set of people we're going to look at is a man named Simon Peter and his brother Andrew. Now, if you are new to the Bible, Peter is this man. If you're a guy, I encourage you to study Peter. Because Peter and King David, for me, are probably the two men in Scripture that I can relate to the easiest, right? They are the two men in Scripture that you can look at and be like, them brothers were messed up. Like, they had, they had some good qualities in their life. They had some promise, but they also had some issues. I mean, Peter walked with Jesus for three years and heard all of Jesus' teaching, and then this guy shows up to arrest Peter, and Peter basically pulls out his sword and cuts the guy's ear off. Like, that's Peter, Right? That's Peter. And so I relate to Peter because, you know, sometimes we can, be, we can be a little abrupt. We can be a little, you know, harsh in some moments. And we got to take a step back and be like, all right, Jesus, I'm sorry. You're in control. I'm going to put my sword away. You go ahead. You do your thing. Like, we got to be like Peter. But we encounter Simon Peter and his brother Andrew in Matthew 4, 18 through 20. And it says, while walking by the Sea of Galilee. Now, this is Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee. It says he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, Jesus comes to them in their place of work and says, follow me, and I'm going to change your occupation. So, again, we're going to shift context. I want you to think about where you work. Maybe you're at the shipyard, and you're a welder, and you're sitting there. You're welding the hull of a ship, and then Jesus walks up, and he's like, follow me. And it says immediately they left their net. So immediately you drop your welder, and you just start following Jesus. You're a nurse, and you're in the hospital, and you're hanging an IV bag, and you're giving somebody an IV, and he's like, he comes in, he says, follow me, and immediately you just drop the IV, and you're out. And the patient's laying there like, wait, what? This is what's happening here. They are fishing. They are earning a living. They are trying to provide for their families. They are out doing their work, 
And Jesus comes by and he says, hey, follow me. I'm going to give you a new identity. Follow me. You used to identify yourself as a fisherman. You used to identify yourself as someone who catches fish, but I'm going to make you a fisher of men. I'm going to change who you are. Come follow me. And it says immediately they left their nets and followed him. Immediately. Here's the first thing we learn about surrender. Surrender requires an immediate response. Surrender requires an immediate response. And here's what I want to challenge you with today in this one, church. Sometimes when God comes to us and says, hey, I need you to do this, our response is not immediate. We're like, you know what, God, I hear you, but you know, if you, you, you know, in Scripture, you gave Moses this burning bush. If you could just give me something like that, then you know what, God, I will come and follow you. You know what, God, I'll follow you, but Jesus, I heard that you fed 5,000 people with, with five loaves and two fish. If you could just do a miracle for me, Jesus, I would follow you too. But our surrender requires an immediate response. And see, oftentimes what we do going back to our puzzle pieces is when we don't give an immediate response, what we're really saying is that, Jesus, I trust you with a few pieces. But now you're stepping into an area that I'm not really ready to surrender to you yet. Now you're stepping into something that I don't want to just fully give to you. And so I'm holding this back for me. When what he says is, I want all of you and I want all of you now. My kids, when, when they were little and in school, they went to a little Christian school in Hampton. And I feel like the school indoctrinated them a little bit, but it's okay. I mean, they, they turned out all right. It's fine. And the only reason I say that, you'll understand in a second, and I love Christian education. Please don't hear me say anything bad about Christian schools. I went to a Christian school myself. But, so they, went, they learned this little song in school about obedience. And it started off like obedience is the very best way. And then it was other words that I forget. But the end of the song, like the last line was, I will obey right away. To delay is to disobey. But they, the way they sang it, I will, I will obey right away. And then they got this big voice, to delay is to disobey. And it's like, well, it's like, it's like a cult, but it's cool because, because they're being obedient. My kids are singing about obedience. That's a big step. Y'all parents know what I'm talking about. Like, you're like, I wish they would obey. And these little kids are just walking around singing about, I will obey right away. The last line of that song has stuck with me for for 15 years because we often assume that delayed obedience is obedience. Your delayed obedience is not obedience. Your delayed obedience is still disobedience because as a parent, I want you to think about something. If you tell your child to clean their room and they don't clean it right away, they're in trouble, aren't they? Because you expect an immediate response. You expect immediate obedience. And so when you come, have to come back to them three or four times and say, why isn't your room clean? Why isn't your room clean? And then they finally do it. You're not pleased. You're not. You're frustrated that you had to talk to them so many times to get them to do what you asked them to do. But we think it's okay for us to treat God that way. We think it's okay for us to say, you know what, God, I know your word says I need to obey you in my giving. I need to obey you in my serving. I need to obey you in how I treat other people. I need to obey you in how I love my wife. I need to obey you in how I respect my husband. But I'm not going to do that just yet for these other reasons. But eventually I get there. And we walk around feeling justified before God, living that way when God would say, you're not surrendering yourself to me. That's disobedience. Surrender requires an immediate response. And I just wonder, church, I just wonder what our lives would look like if we would willingly give him all of who we are immediately. When he says, come follow me, if we would say, yes, Lord, I will follow you. I will go wherever you want me to go. I will do whatever you want me to do. I just wonder how different our lives would be if we would take the approach of Simon, Peter, and Andrew and give an immediate response. The second set of people I'd like to give you a picture of or a look at is Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha. And we encounter Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. And it says this. It says, now as they went on their way, and this is Jesus and his disciples. They are traveling and entering into a village. It says, a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. Verse 40 says, but Martha was distracted with much 
serving. And she went up to him. She went up to Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. Now, when we read this, we often look at Martha like, man, she's really complaining. What's wrong with her? Jesus is here. Why doesn't she realize that? But in Martha's context, Martha was the one that was doing the right thing. It was Martha's place in that context, in that society. When she heard that Jesus, this famous man, this teacher was coming to her house, it was her job to prepare the house. It was her job to make sure that everything was clean, that he was going to have food, that there was going to be somebody there to clean off his feet when he came in. Like she was doing what she was supposed to do. In her context, Mary is the one who was actually wrong. Because it was so inappropriate for a woman to sit at the feet of the rabbi, to sit that close to him and listen to his teaching. It's nothing like, and and so put yourself in this context. In her time, she would have to either sit in a different room or stand outside the door and just hope she could hear what he was saying, or she would have to wait for a man who was listening to Jesus to come out and explain to her what the rabbi taught. And so we read this, and we're hard on Martha. But if you understand their context, you understand why Martha went to Jesus and was like, tell her to come help me. Here's what I want you to hear in that. Sometimes you and I have to do what may not seem culturally appropriate to to be in the presence of Jesus. Our culture oftentimes will tell us we need to stay away from this church stuff. It's just a it's just a bunch of guys trying to get rich. They're trying to take your money. They don't even really believe what they're saying and all this other stuff. Sometimes you have to be a little little countercultural for you to end up in the presence of Jesus. You have to be willing to take some risk. It was a big risk for Mary to sit at the feet of Jesus that day. But she knew this is the one who gives me life. This is the one who that I need to hear from. So I don't care what it may look like to other people. I don't care what it may sound like to other people. I'm going to sit at his feet. And I'm going to learn from him. Do we get so caught up in trying to be culturally appropriate that we miss the opportunity to sit at the feet of Jesus? Do we? Jesus went on in verse 41 to say, but the, it says, but the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha. Now, you know, kids, if your parents say your name twice, you done messed up. I'm like, I'm picturing this and I'm like, Jay, Jay, come on. This is Jesus talking to Martha now. He says, you are anxious and troubled about many things. I want you to notice this passage uses three words to describe Martha. Distracted, anxious, troubled. Does that resonate with you? Do you feel like that's your life? That you are just constantly distracted? Like that there are so many things around you that are distracting you from Jesus that you feel a little bit anxious, like there's this stuff that wells up inside of you. And, and no matter how much you want to focus on him, no matter how much you want to trust in him, this anxiety just builds up inside of you and you feel like you just can't give all of yourself to him. Do you feel troubled? Like there's something you walked in here with today, some kind of weight that you're carrying, something that's on your shoulders that has left you just feeling troubled and you don't see a way out. And notice with Martha's distraction, her distraction wasn't petty distractions like we get caught up with, like like she wasn't watching cat videos on TikTok. She was distracted with serving. She was distracted with something that you you and I would actually look at and say was a good thing. Here's what I want you to hear from me, church. Don't get so distracted with serving that you miss sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now, I'm not telling you don't serve because I think Scripture is very clear, and we're going to see this in a minute, that we are supposed to serve, that we're supposed to give, that we're supposed to be generous. But those things are supposed to be from the overflow of us sitting at the feet of Jesus. They're not supposed to be in place of us sitting at the feet of Jesus. You know, back when the pandemic happened, and, I, and for me, that feel, it feels like it was decades ago now for some reason, but I realized it was just a few years ago. I remember the church I was at at the time, walking into the lobby on a Sunday morning. It was probably like early or mid to late March because that was when everything shut down. That first Sunday, y'all know what I'm talking about. You walked in there and it's like, there's nobody here. This thing that we've done for 20, 30, 40 years is, it shut down. 
and it's me and like four other people because that's all that could be in the building. And we're coming in here to, to turn on a camera to aim it at the stage so that the pastor can be broadcast in people's living rooms. Like this whole thing was different. And I remember talking to people during that time who were like, Pastor Jay, I just feel so disconnected. I don't know what, what my purpose is anymore. And, and as, we dug, as we dug into those conversations, what came to light was their whole relationship with God was based on what they were doing at church on Sunday morning. And so when they couldn't step into the doors of a church on Sunday morning, they felt like their relationship with God had ended. Hear me clearly, church. Your, your relationship with God is not based on you being here on a Sunday morning. You and I should come here every Sunday. We should worship together because our king is worthy of our praise and he's worthy of our worship and he's worthy of us doing that corporately. But if they ever come in and say, you can't do this anymore, you don't stop being the church. You are still the body of Christ. He still has a plan and a purpose for your life. You don't cease to be the church just because you can't meet in a building. And part of what I learned through that experience was that it's so important for us as churches to teach our people and to model for our people what it looks like for you to be the church outside of here on a Sunday morning. But all of that is based on you individually spending time at the feet of Jesus. You and I can't go out and be the church if the only time we ever encounter Jesus is in here at 10 a.m. on Sunday. That's not being the church. You're being a follower of religion. And so I love what Jesus says about Mary in the next verse. He says, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Jesus has just told Martha that you've got your priorities backwards. The good portion is you sitting at my feet. It's you learning from me. It's you hearing these teachings that are going to transform your life. And if you want to take that and then go out and serve, by all means, then take that and go out and serve. But you need to start at my feet. You need to sit at my feet. You need to learn from me. And Mary has chosen this, and that will not be taken away from her. So here's what we learned from Mary and Martha. Surrender requires keeping the main thing the main thing. So surrender requires an immediate response, but it also requires you and me then keeping the main thing the main thing. And I feel like oftentimes in our relationship with God, we start off with Jesus being the main thing. Like we're just excited. We're fired up about Jesus. And then over time, it becomes about all this other stuff. It becomes about our position and our titles and the things that we do and the things we're not allowed to do and the things we can get away with and the rules that we don't have to follow and all this kind of other stuff it becomes about. And we stop keeping the main thing the main thing. If you're going to surrender all that you are to him, you must keep the main thing the main thing. The third person I would point us to in Scripture is Jesus himself. And this passage of Scripture we're going to read about Jesus is found in Matthew 26, 39. And it just says this. It says, and going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And I want you to put yourself in Jesus' shoes for a moment. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us a lot about crucifixion. It doesn't tell us a lot about what that looks like. Scripture really just tells us that Jesus was crucified. But if you read historical books, what you realize is that the Romans used crucifixion as a way to keep people in line. So what the Romans would would do a lot of times is if there was an uprising, if there was a rebellion somewhere, the Romans would line the street with crucifixes. And they would hang people on them for miles. Like, just imagine, just every 10 feet, another crucifix with another person hanging on it for miles down the street. This is what they would do, because their purpose was they want to deter anybody else from, tr- from thinking, I'm going to do what they did. And crucifixion kills you by asphyxiation. Basically, what happens is your legs get so weak they can no longer support your body and your diaphragm can no longer expand so you cannot take in any more breath. And so these people would die from asphyxiation. It wasn't from blood loss or anything that would happen quickly. Sometimes it would take them days to die. So I can imagine Jesus growing up in this Roman-occupied area probably saw people be crucified regularly. 
he probably walked those streets and saw men gasping for air for days, just waiting for their bodies to give out. That's why if you read the story of Jesus' crucifixion, you see that the high priests and the Pharisees, they went to the Romans and said, hey, can somebody break all their legs so that they can die? Because, again, it would take days for them to asphyxiate. And because they had a Passover feast that day, they had a feast to get to. They didn't want to wait for these people to die. So they were like, just break, break their legs so they can asphyxiate and die. And that's when they went out and realized Jesus was already dead. And to make sure the guard pierced his side with a spear. He fulfilled prophecy that no bone in his body would be broken, but he also fulfilled prophecy in that it says that he was pierced for our transgressions. But I'm saying this to you because I want you to understand where Jesus is in this moment. Because we look at Jesus' life and we would say, well, he was able to do what he did and say what he said and endure all he did because he's God. But I feel like this one little verse gives us a bigger glimpse at the humanity of Jesus than any other verse in Scripture. Because what you see right here is a man who said, I know what I'm about to go through. I know that I'm going to be whipped with a cat of nine tails to the point that it's going to rip the flesh from my body. I know that I'm going to have a crown of thorns jammed in my head. That blood's going to pour down my face. I know that I'm going to be nailed to this cross. I'm going to be in pain and agony that nobody wants to endure. So, Father, if there's any other way, please let this cup pass from me. Any other way. Yes, Jesus is God Almighty, but he was also a 100% man. And neither you nor I would want to go through that. And so what we learned from Jesus is that surrender requires dying to self. You know, I am so thankful that you and I live in a place where we can come in here and we can worship him freely. Where I can stand up here and I can boldly proclaim that Jesus is Lord and I don't have to worry that some government official is going to see this video and they're going to come and take my family away and that they're going to torture us or anything like that. Like I can stand up here and be bold in what I'm saying, but sometimes I wonder, would I be this bold if I lived in a place where by me saying Jesus is Lord, somebody was going to come and take Rashida and drag her off to jail and torture her? Or where by me saying Jesus is Lord, somebody was going to come and grab me and they were going to nail me to a cross or burn me at a stake or throw me in a pot of boiling tar. Like, would I be this bold if I knew I was about to end up in the mouth of a lion? Our boldness is easy for us because of where we live. But yet many of us don't want to surrender that part of ourselves to Jesus either. We don't want to be bold for him. We don't want to share our testimony for him. Even though we live in a place where the most backlash we may get is an unflattering post on social media. Maybe if you say the wrong thing in the wrong place, you might lose your job. You're going to live. You're not going to be tortured. And so we have a picture of Jesus here knowing what he's about to go through and being 100% man saying, Father, if there's any other way, I don't want to endure that. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Can you say that, church? No matter what's going to come my way, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Surrender requires dying to self. And there's a part of this where I feel like because of where we live, we don't really like the word surrender. Because I don't know if you notice about Americans, we don't like to lose. Like we don't, we don't like to lose at all. Right? Like we'll even rewrite some stuff to make it look like we didn't lose. We don't like to lose. But we often equate surrender with losing. But hear me on this. Surrendering to Christ leads to victory. And part of what we need to realize, church, is that even though we equate surrender to losing, It's going to lead you and me to victory. We have the only faith that says you must die to live. You must surrender to win. And oftentimes the fight that we have is striving to get victory for ourselves instead of surrendering to Christ. Oftentimes the fight that we have is is we want to live and we want to experience our best life instead of dying to self. And so you would need, God would say to you and me that we need to fully surrender all to him. 
And so what does that look like in our context here in the seven cities? What does it look like for you and me to live out these principles that we just learned, that my surrender requires an immediate response, that it requires me keeping the main thing the main thing, and that it requires me dying to myself? And the first thing is this, we need to serve and give because Jesus served and gave. But we need to remember Mary and Martha in this and that this serving and this giving is not our act based on what we want to do. It's based on what he's already done. In other words, it needs to come from the overflow of our relationship with him. And hear me clearly in this. We ask people around here, hey, can you serve? We need you to plug in in this place. We need you to plug in in that place. But I want you to serve from the overflow of your relationship with Jesus. I want you to serve from a place of I am connected to him, and because he served, I'm going to serve. I am connected to him, and because he gave, I'm going to give. I don't want you doing this stuff out of compulsion. I want you doing it because you're in a relationship with God Almighty, and he's put it on your heart to do it. We read in Mark 10, 45, it says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And because he gave his life for me, now I'm willingly to go out and give my life for him. The next thing we do is that we do this cheerfully. We do it all cheerfully. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7 says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will reap or also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God wants your attitude to be in the right place. And this is one thing I tell people about their money all the time. God doesn't need your money. God wants your heart. And what he's really after, and this is why he points out that God loves a cheerful giver, is he wants you to give from an attitude of gratitude. He doesn't want you to just throw some money in a box just because now I feel guilty, and if I don't give it, they're going to read Malachi chapter 3, that I'm cursed with a curse and all this other stuff. He wants your heart. He wants a relationship with you, and he wants you to be so impacted by who he is that you mimic him in your life. And he's the God who said, I'm going to clothe myself in flesh. I'm going to come down. I'm going to serve you because I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. And so his expectation is that as you grow in him, you serve also. And he's the same God that says he so loved the world that he gave his only son. And so his expectation is that because he gave, as you grow in him, you give. Not out of compulsion or of necessity because what? God loves a cheerful giver. He wants your heart. So we serve and give because Jesus served and gave, and we do it cheerfully. And then the third thing is we do it for his glory, not our own. We do it for his glory, not our own. That passage back in Psalm 46.10, where Jesus said, or God said, be still and know that I'm God. I will be exalted in all the earth. I will be exalted in the heavens. God wants his glory. And when you give and do things out of compulsion, what you're really doing is you're doing it for your own glory and you're doing it for your own purposes. He wants you to do it for his glory and for his purpose. We read this in Colossians 3, 17. It says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Everything you do in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So if I were going to sum all of this up into one big idea for you, I would say this. The big idea is living a surrendered life is living with an open hand, not a closed fist, and doing it all for the glory of God. Now, some of you have little babies, and you realize how counterintuitive this is. If you think about your baby, we like to think like their first word is mama or dada. Most little babies' first word is mine. Like, they grab something, they will not let it go. That's mine, brother. (laughs) Like, you cannot have this toy. It's mine. You cannot have this cheese puff you were about to put in your mouth. I'm taking it. It's mine. That's what little kids do. And so what this tells me is that when we live life only giving God little pieces and we hold on to the rest saying, this is mine, we're spiritual babies. We're spiritual babies. Because the spiritually mature says, Lord, you can have it all. I know it's all from you anyway. So I'm going to freely give back to you what you've given me. Not my will, but your will be done. Because the job, I only have it because you gave it to me. The house, I only have it because you provided it. My health, 
I only have it because you breathe life into me every day. Everything that I have is already yours. So I freely and willingly give it all back to you. Now, Scripture tells us that God gives us every good thing for our enjoyment. So when you freely give it all back to him, he doesn't take it all and leave you broke. He doesn't take it all and leave you homeless and leave you destitute. It says he gives you all things to enjoy. So you don't have to be afraid to open your hand and say, Lord, it's all yours. Because your God will provide. He said, if you seek my kingdom first, I'll take care of your needs. His name is Jehovah Jireh, which means he's the Lord God, your provider. It's part of his character. It's who he is. You don't have to hold on to it. He is going to provide for you. It would be against his nature not to. He never goes against his own nature. So you don't have to hold on to it all yourself. So I have a reflection question for you today, and it's this. Are you living a surrendered life? Are you living a surrendered life? Not a, not a life of surrendering pieces. Because you and I will walk around wondering why we never feel whole and why we don't see the whole picture, and it's because we haven't put ourselves in the hands of the one who makes us whole. Have you given yourself fully to him? And if not, don't move forward from this point. And what I mean by that is this. Over the next two weeks, we're going to talk about two more marks of a disciple, our last two, being moved with compassion and reaching one more. I don't want you to move to those if you're not fully surrendered to him. Because again, if you're not fully surrendered to him, you won't be moved with compassion. You'll be moved with compulsion. And when you go out to reach one more, you will be doing it for your purpose and your glory so that you don't feel guilty or so that you can pat yourself on the back. Whereas when you're fully surrendered to him, you'll do it for his glory and his kingdom and his purpose. And so I want you to live fully surrendered to him. I just wonder, church, what it would look like for us if we just fully surrendered ourselves to him. If we said, Lord, you can have it all. Take all the fear, take all the doubt, take all the worries. You can have the job, you can have the income, you can have it all, Jesus. I lay it all at your feet. Do with it what you will. Not my will, but your will be done. I just wonder what this church would look like if we would live that way. And there's a reflection promise that that I believe he gives us with this in living a surrendered life. And it's Jesus talking in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30. He says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I think about Martha, distracted, anxious, and troubled. I bet she could use some rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. A yoke in this context was a rabbi's teaching. When you followed a rabbi, that was said to take, be taking on their yoke. And so who did that? Mary. She was taking on his yoke and learning from him. He said, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Do you need rest for your souls today? For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What he's saying is if if you live with an open hand, if you just surrender it all to me, this yoke that you're going to take on, it's going to be the easy yoke. It's going to be the light burden. You will go through life with joy. You will go through life with peace. It doesn't mean that everything's going to be unicorns and rainbows all the time. They don't exist anyway, unicorns, that is. But it doesn't mean that things are going to always be that. But it does mean that you can have peace in the midst of the storm because you know and obey the one that even the storm and the sea obey. And so here's a few takeaways for you. First and foremost, you and I must be born again. If we're going to live a surrendered life, we must be born again. And I would challenge you to read John chapter 3, um, verses 1 through 21, where he talks about what it means to be born again, to be born of the Spirit, not just of the flesh. And Jesus, or God, saying that he so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever, that means you, that means me, would believe in him, would not perish but have everlasting life. And then he even tells us why. Because God didn't send his son into the world to condemn you and me, but that the world, that you and me through him might be saved. So we must be born again. You must present your body to him as a living sacrifice and be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Not just parts of you, but all of you. We must give all of yourself back to him and be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then we can be generous with our time, talent, treasure, and testimony. Don't be afraid to share your faith. Don't be afraid to open your hands and say, God, I freely give back to you all that you have given me. Now, you're going to get a Sunday recap sheet when you leave today, and it actually talks a little bit about that passage there, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8, and it talks about Matthew 11, 28 through 30. I encourage you to take one of those as you go. If you did down or if you're using the app and have the notes on the app, 
The Sunday recap is at the bottom of that notes page as well. And when you're done with it, you can send a PDF of that to yourself so you will have your copy as well. But if you have more questions about what it means to be born again or, or how to enter into this relationship with Jesus and how Seven Cities Church can be a part of that in your life, um, I invite you to join us for First Step. And our next one is going to be on December 1st. If we can go ahead and go to the next slide, um, it's going to be on December 1st. You can scan that QR code to register for that and join, oh, excuse me, and join us in First Step. If you're like, hey, Pastor Jay, I'm already surrendered to Christ. I want to move forward with this thing. I want to move forward with this mission. I invite you to become an owner and join us in the mission and vision of Seven Cities Church because we exist to glorify God as we guide people to life in Christ by making disciples and planting churches. And you can join us on that mission. You can become an owner. You can fill out an ownership form in the lobby at the Connect Space, or you can scan that QR code and fill out a digital form as well. Caleb's going to come back up in a moment or two and talk about this, but I'm going to pray over you, and then we're going to worship the Lord together one more time through music before we go. And I just invite you during that time to just take a moment and pray and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you if there's any area of your life, is there, if there's any piece of you that you're holding back from him, if there's any piece of you that you have not willingly fully surrendered to him, and just ask him to reveal that to you. If it's your whole life and you need to surrender in, in accepting Jesus as your Lord, I encourage you to ask the Holy Spirit to make that plain and clear to you, for him to give you the faith to believe in this moment. If it's just surrendering a part of you because you're already following after him, then for him to make that plain as well. But let me pray over you. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, just thankful for who you are. I thank you for your church, Lord.